This is my interview with Michael Lorsung. He's a professor of sculpture at Ball State University in Indiana in the United States, and I've known him for a number of years. One thing that's impressed me about his, his work is um, how he deals with um, landscapes, social systems, and technology. Uh, the piece that he has in this particular exhibition uh, called Transit, which has to do with um, basically putting three, um, six motion triggered um, recording units inside a box and sending it by a FedEx from uh, across three states shows a lot about what we don't know about this idea of the um, of the logistics chain, which in 2021 is really important because of the fact that at least in the United States and across half of the world, the logistics chain uh, shipping and, and transport has um, at least partially broke down. Um, and this has to do a great deal with, um, you know, the, this notion of biopolitics and infopolitics and how they, how they intersect. And so this is my interview with Michael and it goes for about 25 minutes. So thank you very much. Yeah, I'm here with uh, Michael Lorsung and actually we met uh, for the first time about, uh, I think, 15 years ago when I was in graduate school at uh, Bowling Green University and he was doing a lot of uh, really interesting uh, intersections between um, aesthetic social structures and, and, and technology and we have his piece Transit in this particular um, in this particular project, and um, I'm uh, I'm wondering whether you could give um, some you know kind of some specifics about the the project. Sure, um, thanks, Patrick. Um, so you know, transit for me started. Um, oh God, it probably started about five years ago when I started thinking about uh, the logistics supply chain and my engagement with it as a consumer and as a member of, of the, the, the uh, sort of economic structure here in the United States, and then by proxy, the economic structure globally. Um, and I was obviously, like many people, shipping things both in and out of my residence and places of business and, and sort of watching these things appear and disappear uh, without a whole lot of thought about what was happening in the interim. Um, and it, I realized at that point that there was this sort of fertile ground that existed in that sort of gray space, that liminal space between when a package shows up at your door and when it leaves a shipper, or when it leaves your door and shows up at the receiver's end. Uh, and so I started thinking around this idea of like, how do I explore that space? How do I get into that space? And what is that space? Um, you know, typically in uh, Western culture, we have a perception of, of industry as being this black box uh, in which things happen, but we're not really sure how they happen. Um, and oftentimes we ascribe that to a kind of technological magic um, things sort of come in and out of a conveyor belt with very little human interaction. Um, but my experience in this industry tells me that actually that's not true and that sort of humanity exists throughout that process and that it's integral um, and completely discounted. Um, so it's a kind of invisible labor that we're all benefiting from and that I'm benefiting from, um, but that we that really goes sort of unconsidered and unknowable. Um, and so I as I was thinking about this, it, 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 uh, I came to understand that maybe the most direct way to engage with this was photographically. Um, and so I built uh, a, a box that, that gets shipped through FedEx. And I'm using FedEx specifically because of their status as a carrier. Um, they're a private carrier, obviously. They're not federalized. They're not nationalized. Um, in addition to that, separate from UPS, their counterpart, um, they're a, they're a non-union employer. So they're employing people without mm. union benefits. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that has to do with sort of like how, I mean, it's a sort of a, a long and, and arcane explanation that, that, that actually dates back to sort of when railroads were unionized and how different classes of, of freight handling are addressed and that sort of thing. I won't get into that too much, but that was sort of the, my kind of introduction to what they are. And so I, I built a box that, that essentially has six outward facing cameras um, and these can cameras, initially, I would thought about sort of addressing them as um, not just sort of intervalometer controlled 
uh, but controlled by sort of motion and that sort of thing. And I, I started realizing that actually I was more interested in sort of the totality of that transit. And so I, I went back to addressing them as being controlled by intervalometers. And so they were, they were taking photographs every 15 seconds over the course of the transit, um, which totaled somewhere in the neighborhood of about 86,000 individual frames uh, mm -hmm. that are then stitched together into the six channel video uh, that's being presented here in this ex exhibition. Sure, sure, sure. So um, let's see, where did, where did the, uh, where did the, where did the parcel begin and where did it end? So on the particular transit that we're looking at, it, um, it began in um, uh, Muncie, Indiana, where I'm based out of currently. I teach at Ball State University. Okay. And it ended in Olawine, Iowa, which is about 500 miles from here, about 488 miles from here um, at a Super 8 motel. Okay, that's an interesting place for it to end up. How how long did the transit actually take? It's about two and a half days. Okay, okay. So there's um, Alex Galloway in his in his book um, Protocol. He 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 talks about um, you know different different layers of um, information transport within computer systems, um, you know networks, etc. Called protocols. But the thing is, is that I think that there is a um, a real metaphor for for this as it goes and as information as objects as information, and especially now. And I want to get into the global supply chain issues that we have um, um, today after the uh, after the after the pandemic in a moment. But in other words, you have this point, you have this point of entry and you have this point of sorting, you have this point of transport, then you have this point of routing, coming back and such as it did. Did you notice, you know, this, um, you know, this, you know, these different layers of protocol, you know, as this, as this, as this piece of information went from point A to point B? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That definitely came out and exposed itself in the in the document that this object creates. Um, and I was thinking a lot about network stacks and about this idea that you have these like layered protocol systems that are are routing information. And and if we think about information as physical object, which it actually is, and we don't think about that because I mean, every time I transfer a gigabyte of data, I'm creating three kilograms of carbon, right? Hmm. So. You know, so it actually does have a real. There is a a, a link between this virtual and physical world. Yeah, um, I think it, I think it's really interesting to 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 think about the, you know, the 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 materiality, whether it's infra, whether it's digital or whether it's um, you know what what I call um, you know a, a atomic matter. You know, and yeah, that, that's very interesting. Yeah, and so so yeah, there is there is sort of an analog there, and and it's not even so much that it's sort of a metaphoric analog. It's very much, um, it's you know our sort of physical need to move material, whether that's actual material or data material, is is really sort of um, it kind of sits in this in between place between the world that we imagine as being the old world of strictly physical goods and the world that we might imagine as being the new world. Of, of, of data driven goods or, or sort of goods that exist simply as data. Um, and I think about it a lot, you know, looking at this document, I, I, I see a lot of analogs between this and sort of the analog telephone network um, mm. and how communication stacks existed there. Um, the interesting thing about this kind of a data stack, if you want to think about a, a logistic supply chain as a data stack, is that it's physically traceable. Um, mm which which is different from like an IP protocol stack, right? Which is not physically traceable in the same way. Like I can't point to a packet and say like, look, there goes that packet. I can snip a packet. I can look at a packet with Wireshark or something like that, but I can never actually sort of know that. And so it's sort of observationally um, kind of like the difference between constructing and an understanding and a thesis based on physical observation and constructing an observation and thesis based on sort of the interpretation of data. Um, and this is much more sort of geared towards that. So there is sort of play back and forth between that. Um, but I don't think it's ever sort of, you know, I think the, I think generally when we think about explaining information and data systems to people, one of the mistakes that we make is in trying to find immediate physical analogs rather right. than addressing them as their own structures. And so while there are analogs that exist there, um, and I think they're important. Um, it, 
the 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 metaphor falls apart um, pretty rapidly once you get into the minutia of what a an actual data stack might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was um, there's another there's another person in the um, show uh, Vikram Devecha who once did a thing called the um, the warehouse project in which he um, basically got a uh, warehouse in Dubai and let a um, um, uh, let a uh, toy distributor, um, you know, put their things in and basically left it open though to the public though. And you could see the things, you could see the toys coming in and out. You could see the, my little, you know, you could see the, how the, how the stacks of my little pony, you know, change shape and that sort of thing as a form of, so, you know, social sculpture, um, you know, and in this case, I, I see, you know, kind of the inversion of this. I see this as one of those, you know, one, one of those potentially maybe those my little my little pony boxes you know coming coming in and out the one th the one thing that i'm interested in here is that since this particular exhibition you know this your 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 particular piece is basically going from one point to another in midwestern america um you know and it's already you know under the aegis of all these losing you know uh, regimes of control you know i'm just wondering um how you you know how you see this, you know um, how you see the ramifications of this particular work expanding out. You know, if it's going into you know a uh, a global level, I mean, it's my but you know possibly say if you sent this to oh I don't know I, you know Azerbaijan um, or even or even more interestingly you know like Iran, um, you know how do you know how do you see um, you know the 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 record that you get, you know, being different possibly by hitting container ships or possibly even seeing what happens, you know, when a, when a border guard opens it or right. know, something like that. Yeah. You know, so yeah. how, how, how do you see the different modalities of this thing happening as, as, as it goes into the uh, global, um, global system? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good question. And it's something that, you know, this is, uh, the physicality of this work is is pretty brand new. And so this is one of its first two transits that it's taken. Um, and the idea is that, you know, eventually it's going to sort of continue on this, on this circuitous path to different places. Um, and right now I've been working sort of primarily within North America for a couple of reasons. And one is that it's where I'm located um, and I'm dealing sort of specifically with the idea of kind of this domestic network of things. Um, but that said, like, I'm really interested in the possibility of this sort of moving outward. Um, it brings in some, you know, your question about document, I think, is a really good one. Um, because I, I think there's a level of predictability. If I send this thing to North Korea, um, the document that exists will be the object no longer existing in the world. Right. Um, and, and, and perhaps similarly, depend on other places, too. I mean, it, it, uh, I actually have, I, you know, I have no real sort of I have no way of knowing what would happen if this thing crosses any international border other than it's going to happen at some point. And I guess I'll find out. Uh, and probably the first foray into that will be Canada or Mexico. Of course. Um, and there's a really good chance that like it doesn't make it back. Um, right. You know, which there's a lot of kind of like nuts and bolts, logistical questions around that. Um, yeah, and, and then and what does that say? Right. Exactly. You know, like, yeah. what does it mean for that thing to sort of just like disappear? Um, I mean, right. I think now we're getting into sort of, uh, now it, it, at that point, it can begin to sort of uncover social structures that are linked to these economic structures. Um, this idea of borders and how borders function and what they do to objects and how objects have analogs to data and how anal data and objects have analogs to people. Um, and, then, and then maybe how do these things convert information to noise when depending, uh, depending on the, uh, depending on the, uh, uh, constraints of the system. Well, and what can you pull out of that noise? Yeah. You know, um, and, and, and bureaucratic noise is really interesting because it, it is primarily noise and the signal that's in there is usually something that you have to have some, um, you need a little bit of a Rosetta stone to be able to interpret it. Um, uh, mm. how, how or why something disappears will give you indications to how that thing is received. Um, and there are, there are ways around this too. You know, there is the possibility Right now, this thing was really sort of like most of my work because of where I'm coming from and what I do and who I am and what my background is. It, it's all bootstrapped. 
Um, and so it's like, you know, physically, this thing is being controlled by $60 worth of ESP32 hardware, um, which and, is like, by, by the way, just for, you know, just for those people who aren't, you know, familiar with these things, you know, can, could you wind up explaining a little bit about this? Yeah, so an ESP thirty two is just it's a um, it's a microprocessor. It's actually a microprocessor that you're going to find in a lot of Internet of Things devices that you can buy from companies like Amazon and whoever else. Sure. Um, and, and the nice thing is that as a as a microcontroller, it has inputs and outputs that you can interface with physical things, um, and it also has this particular <coughs> module has the ability to have a small camera uh, linked directly mm -hmm. to it, which can then be controlled and read to a, a micro SD card. Um, the, the SP32 also has inbuilt um, uh, communication protocols, so Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy, and um, 802.11 uh, Wi-Fi. Um, so there's a lot of sort of possibilities there, and I think that before this thing goes across an international border, that hardware situation, what I'd like to do is to is to um, is to reconfigure it so it's actually interfacing directly with a cellular network. Mm -hmm. and streaming this data to a point in the cloud so that it can be stored outside of the box. Because right now, my ability to sort of gather that document is entirely predicated on my ability to recollect it. Um, right. Right. And if I'm going to be doing something that, if, I, if I'm sending it places where it may not come back from, um, even if I'm even if it renders very little useful data, I'd like to have some of that data because its ability to collect data for me is, is a big part of sort of its objecthood. Right, 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 right. So say, for example, I mean, I can see, I can see where, I can see where you could be exploring, you know, differences between um, supply chain protocols as far as, you know, how it, how it controls objects and that sort of thing between, say, like the United States Postal Service, UPS, you know, a FedEx, and that could that could reveal a lot of you know social political in, in, in informa in information. Yeah, you know, and, and the part of that that I'm really interested in, and actually, like maybe to back up a little bit, like one of the places that this all came out of was the idea that there was going to be this kind of incidental candid portraiture that occurred. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm really sort of interested in if you were to sit and watch the full 45 minute run of this. There are some moments there where people appear on camera, um, and and they appear in a variety of different ways. And and maybe the most compelling one was the guy who is clearly doing this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and he's nobody right. in particular. You know, he's somebody who's on a sort line in some facility somewhere. But he's kind of figuring things out. He's but he's looking at it and he's go, he's he's connecting it. You know, yeah. he's starting to sort of. There's a moment of interaction there that occurs that I think is really fascinating. And I think seeing the differences in those structures as you were talking about, the technology is one thing. And I think there's probably a lot of kind of indiscernible differences that, that, that what the data that this gathers may not actually get to in that, um, although future iterations of it may. Um, but I think the, 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 the difference that I'm interested in is, is, is are those moments and, and sort of the, the amount and kind of contact that this thing has with humans as it moves through these sort of uh, very monolithic uh, 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 supply chain structures. Yeah, yeah, is it, um, you know, the, um, I'm going to uh, get to something that you mentioned about this in, in just a, se a second, but um, one thing that's happening is that this particular show is at, at the, um, um, during the, um, during the late stages, hopefully of the of the COVID uh, pandemic, and one of the one of the great thing, well, one of the um, largest uh, the one of the largest um, effects that I saw of the of, of the pandemic when I moved from the United Arab Emirates to the United States was the utter collapse of the uh, of of the um, transport and supply chain. And the thing is, is that uh, what um, you know, what what as what aspects of this uh, particular uh, set of you know, like what I'd say, social industrial effects, you know, did you uh, did did you see with the project, or if any? You know, I'm not sure that I saw any of it in the project, and I mean, okay. it, I this is a really interesting sort of subject, and it, it, I think it's related to the project 
and again, it's, you know, sort of seeing this single document um, and understanding it as a, um, a, as an entryway into a larger project that's obviously still mm -hmm. in the works, I, that. Yeah, I think yeah, is yeah. important. Um, but, you know, your question about supply chains, you know, it's really interesting. Like, I'm not a labor scholar, so there's probably things that you could fact check here and may not be totally accurate. But from my understanding of what I've been reading and, and looking at in um, the context of our current situation with supply chains is that very little of it has to do with actual scarcity um, mm -hmm. and, and very little of it has to do with the supply chains breaking in the way that we might think that they're breaking. Right. Um, and, and, and in fact, a lot of it has to, it's really interesting. Like if you look at global logistics in a historical sense, mm -hmm. um, you know, shipping containers, right? Like big 40, 53 foot long shipping containers that go aboard um, ocean going vessels and, and get transported from here to there and stacked with goods and blah, blah, blah. Sure. Those things only date back to the Korean War. Mm -hmm. Right. So like mm. this was, you know, basically during the Korean War, the United States as an imperial empire went and said like, we need a better way to move stuff from here to there so that we can more efficiently make war in these places blah 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 right and they came and they came up with the this this standardized unit um fast forward you know so at the same time you've got um japan as a post-war empire uh with a struggling economy the united states has a vested interest in making that economy better because right. we need that as a location to fight wars in korea and in uh, subsequently in vietnam um so we invested heavily in that. Um, and then you've got Toyota who emerges with the Toyota manufacturing model, um, yeah. which is the basis for our contemporary understanding of lean manufacturing. Right. And I'm coming back to the supply chain here, but it, but I'm going there sort of through the lens of labor because that's actually what we're dealing with is a labor issue and not so yeah. much a supply chain issue. And, and, and also I want to kind of put in, you know, the development of the just in time, you know, just in time delivery, you know, it can, it can it construction and, and, uh, delivery and construction model as you know being something as part of the part of the lean structure that really um, you know was the um, really probably the um, the the scaffold for the uh, the the failure of the uh, world logistical um, structure you know at this point you know under the under the pan under the pandemic. Yes, absolutely. And that's kind of where I was going is that okay. this just in time model of being able to provide sort of the that you know, for those who aren't aware, the 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 model of just-in-time manufacturing is the is uh, is the idea that a company should be able to sort of pivot with market demand and go like, oh, cu customers want this. Wait, no, they want this. Now we can make those. So in the old model of manufacturing, if I'm manufacturing um, uh, paper cups or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I've got a warehouse somewhere. I'm filling that thing with paper cups. I'm sending them to market. I'm always sort of dealing with warehousing issues. Uh, that's overhead, right? And so yeah. just-in-time manufacturing is like, hey, what if we're only making enough of something to ship for the particular demand that we have in a moment? And then that allows us to then make adjustments without losing the money of investing in product that we can no longer sell, having to sell at a loss, blah, blah, blah. It's great in theory. Um, the problem is it's, it's really resource intensive, even though it's not yes. sort of intensive from a capital standpoint. Um, and it doesn't actually adjust to the kinds of demand changes that we saw at the onset of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and, and those demand changes have, have, have continued, or those demand sort of spikes and cycles have continued to show that there's stress in that system. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and so this is all causing problems. And in the meanwhile, the other thing that the pandemic did is it gave a whole bunch of people, particularly here in the United States, who never really understood in their lifetimes what it meant to have free time, some free time. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, like, you know, now we're talking, you know, you've got news outlets talking about the great exodus from work that Americans in some sectors are making and how people are mm -hmm. reticent to go back to work and certain jobs, it's like you can't fill them. You know, that's one thing that the pandemic did that was maybe a good thing. Um, we'll see. Um, but yeah. it also, you know, has spurred, you know, so now you've got major labor strikes, you've got um, Kellogg's happening, you've got John Deere happening, you've got, um, there's a variety of stuff happening in West Virginia and Kentucky, uh, in coal mining sure. and extractive mm -hmm. industries. 
And there's a whole bunch of other ones that I'm probably missing. The big one that I want to focus on for the purpose of this conversation is John sure. Deere. Um, yeah, okay, go ahead. So John Deere, you know, they they all went on strike. Great. Right, in the yes. old model of manufacturing, uh, a company, you know, in the United States, you can't, as a union, just go on strike, right? I can't oh. just like as a union go like, tomorrow we're going on strike. It's called wildcatting. It's illegal, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so in the old model of manufacturing, a company would look at their contract length and they'd go, okay, our contract with this union expires in a year. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and ramp up production on everything six months before that contract period, negotiation right. period comes up. And we'll just go ahead and make sure we have enough product on hand to weather that storm. No big right. deal. So like, even if this is a protracted labor battle, like we can still ship stuff to customers. We're still going to be able to run our business as we normally would. And we absorb that into our overhead. Right. In in lean manufacturing and just on time stuff, that's gone. And so instead, what you've got is the situation you have at John Deere right now, where corporate sent out memos to all of their corporate employees saying, hey, um, we've got this strike happening. So we're going to need you to go work in the uh, in the machine shop. Yeah. Um, which is actually happening, you know, which is insane. Mm. Um, you mm -hmm. know, so if you're looking to buy a tractor, you might want to wait a couple of years. Um, yep. But but it but it really sort of points to it, it it gives you a really clear sense of how in some ways, um, in the effort of kind of maximi maximizing profit and capital underneath this this lean manufacturing structure, the thing that didn't get accounted for was the human element of that labor contingent of that of that that particular sort of part portion of the stack of that system, if you will. Is, yeah. is okay like yeah we've got all of these things dialed in but no one really went back and went like well wait a minute what if people went on strike or what if we sort of end up with this this catastrophic failure at this human point in the system um which is now what we're looking at so you've got all of these sort of different things compounding and you know i think that this work as it develops is going to begin to in a de facto way start to address some of that stuff sure um if you look at what it what it's done right now we can think about it as basically connect, collecting a very, very sort of narrow band uh, of, of data across the entirety of this structure. Right. And the goal is that eventually it's going to collect enough data that that data gives us some ability to understand the system in a fundamentally different way. Yes. Um, that's the hypothesis of it. Mm, okay. Whether how that bears out, you know, remains to be seen. Yeah. 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 And, and the, the other thing is, is that this, this, this this brings me to a really interesting metaphor that you uh, that that you put, and I think that's probably going to start getting down towards the end of the conversation. Is that uh, uh, you um, you mentioned to me that you consider this thing as a you know consider this this well I, I like to consider it an apparatus you know sure. um, you know for many things you know for um you know uh, uh, you know observing these uh you know various regimes of effects and you know and and uh, and tracking and and just you know looking at these things I, I really like the idea that you call this thing a satellite and i think this is a really interesting idea you know if you think of if you think of a satellite as something that you know that orbits around the earth and uh, or you know, well we think of a satellite that's something that orbits around the earth um you know observing things and uh you know i think that you're you know, putting forth another another gesture. And the thing is, is that I would also like to maybe give you a provocation of saying, well, we have one definition that is pretty uh, widely known as, you know, with this idea of the internet of things. But the thing is, is that, well, maybe we could call this is that, you know, you're you're exploring the, the, the network of, the, the network of things or the thing, you know, the thing, the, the network that deals with things. Rather than the, uh, you know, um, you know, when when people say the Internet of Things, basically talking about just objects that you know have some sort of have connectivity, sort of network control. Yeah, and yeah. but I think but what you're talking about is is you know another another metaphor for this, which is just as powerful actually. So you know the satellite and this you know this other you know you know this almost sort of like Internet of Material. Yeah, I mean it's a you know it's networks are nothing new. They're not you know we've Networks oh. have been around long before we invented ways yeah, to connect well, computers Pony together. Pony Express, yeah. you know. Sure, so, right. Yeah. You know, um, and 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 prior to that, you know, like social sort of structures are essentially networks in a particular mm -hmm. way. Um, the nodes are just different, and the points of contact and the way that sort of things and people are interfacing is just different. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, this idea of it being like a satellite, I mean, that was the first sort of like metaphor that I came up with to think about it. And, and I was thinking about it because I was thinking about, you know, again, this logistic supply chain is this like black box, which is kind of like outer space for us. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like this, it's this unknown. Um, it's a thing that, that we recognize as having influence on our lives, but that most of us don't have a full or partial or even sort of minute understanding of except in the crudest terms yeah you're sending this out into this you know this um you know this this protocological material space you know yeah yeah you know and and the idea is much like satellites like you know when we've sent the first satellites out into space we kind of went like okay we've got some assumptions based on our observations let's go see what bears out from this right you know and I, I see this as like sort of being along those lines so maybe this is kind of like sputnik or maybe it's kind of like not to overstate its importance but it it i think it has a similar sort of intentionality and a similar kind of you know um uh mindfulness about this idea that yes it's exploring the unknown but no there isn't sort of some like you know i don't have an agenda of like this is the data that i need Right. Um, because I don't really know what the data that exists in the field is yet. Right. Um, right. You know, it's, I mean, you so, we're looking at this from a, you know, from a, almost a scientific perspective, and it, because of the fact that, you know, you have these, you have these hypotheses that you're approaching this with, but, you know, you have really, you know, uh, there, there, you don't really have any expectations. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have assumptions um, and, and I'm, and I'm completely willing to, to acknowledge any and all of those assumptions as having been incorrect. Right. Um, right. You know, and, you know, so like, yeah, if you want to describe it as a satellite, I think that works. I think I've also thought about it in terms of being, you know, like one of these undersea sort of um, autonomous vehicles that goes into, mm -hmm. you know, some deep remote part of the ocean. Um, you know, and, and we tend to sort of think about our world as largely being known, but these black boxes that are created by industry, these sort of portions of this mm -hmm. network of stuff that we exist within that we kind of just go like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to ship this via FedEx. And I, you know, I print the label off and I bring it to the FedEx counter and then it's gone. And then I call my buddy two days later and he goes, oh yeah, I got that. No problem. There's a huge gap. There's a blackout there. And those are the sort of right. trenches or parts of the space that I'm really interested in exposing. Okay. Okay. Is that, um, that it kind of reminds me, you know, this idea of the black box is that see, um, that um, the critical art ensemble in, in their uh, last book, um, I think it was with uh, aesthetics and necropolitics. They're, they're talking about basically the system has become so indeterminate. And this also kind of mirrors uh, Adam Curtis's latest um, um, uh, documentary, uh, um, Hyper Normalization, which I, I don't think says it half as well as, uh, as uh, uh, Steve Kurtz does is that the the system has become so complex that it's uh you know it's the it's indeterminacy that has basically you know black boxed it and that we try to use these simple metaphors to try to wrap wrap our heads around it and in some ways it's it's this is sort of a probe into that indeterminacy yeah no I think that's a I mean I think that's true um you know and and there are other issues sort of baked into it um, there's a huge layer of problematics in this and that it's conducting surveillance on people, um, yeah. you know, but it's also sort of doing that within a structure that's also doing that. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know, what you're doing, with my, what Steve Mann might be calling is a form of su a surveil a surveillance. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So what's what's so far with this particular intervention this this, this hopefully being the first of many you know is what's you know what is probably besides you know these these points of personal connection you know that uh, that you're coming away from with this um you know <laughs> one of the things that that i think was unexpected for me and i don't know why this was unexpected because mm -hmm. when i look at it i go like yeah of course that makes perfect sense um is the amount of blackness Hmm. Um, the, the amount of darkness that exists in that transit and how mm -hmm. much of that time that this thing spends is actually time like waiting. Um, hmm. And how compelling that actually was for me to watch once I sort of assembled this thing as, as a piece of, of video. Um, and, and that actually does a lot to sort of, you know, initially I was sort of, I was like, oh man, that's kind of a bummer. I was, but then I was like, wait a minute, like, no, no, no this is like, 
these sort of slight shifts in light and dark and, and all this stuff. Wait, wait, wait a second. Were, were, you, were you sort of expecting this thing to be sort of, a, is sort of a FedEx roller coaster ride or, uh, you know? I don't know. I'm not yeah. sure what I was expecting. I, um, I, I don't know that I had like a, an image of it. I just sort of was taken aback by how much of it was dark. Mm. Um, on the other hand, like that darkness also sort of added a really nice punctuation to the moments where it became sort of activated and it was right. moving at, sort of in a very discernible way through this. Sure. Um, sure. And I, I see, I guess, so I think as a takeaway, you know, uh, what I'm looking forward to in the, in the subsequent iterations of this um, is to start to really kind of compile these films or these videos mm -hmm. um, and, and start to look at them as sort of an aggregate data set um that's what's exciting to me right now is like okay great like i have a proof of concept that this sort of method for collecting this data set works um right. the second part of that is that um in future iterations um i want to start equipping this thing with more sensors like what um i want to uh i'm gonna i'm gonna set up an esp another esp32 inside of this box that will be doing um network detection and logging okay so it's going to log um, at, throughout its process, sort of what radio signals are around it, um, and mm -hmm. what's being sort of put out there um, as a beacon, um, as a way of thinking about place. Um, I'm interested in in potentially um, uh, recording audio um, uh, through it. Um, That's interesting. Things like, um, and then there's like data that I don't know how it's going to be useful. Um, but I think it could be in terms of like recording barometric pressure and temperature changes. Sure. Sure, um, sure, sure. So, you know, really sort of creating now that this thing, now that I know that this thing sort of works in one way, um, starting to enrich in, you know, version 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. Sure. Um, the uh, the field of the field array of sensors and, and data that it's capable of 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 obtaining. Um, you know, so like this is basically, you know, a self-contained sensor node. Right, right. In other words, it's like, you know, you're going to keep, uh, you know, developing these, uh, these logis these global logistical space probes. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. 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 That's, 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 that's really interesting. So, well, I'll tell you what, I want to thank you for being part of this. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is this is a, a really fascinating project, and the the one thing is I, I wish you I wish you luck as you go into uh, um, let's see here start hitting uh, other 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 borders throughout time and space. You know, is that uh, when you start getting into the you know uh, further into the geopolitical uh, you know spheres of the world. You know, so I, I'd I'd love to I'd love to see what would happen if one of these things went to Mongolia. You know. Yeah, and I mean, I think I think those are those are definitely sort of long term questions for this project, um, and it's one of the reasons that I want to sort of develop this expanded network of sensors to put inside of this thing, mm -hmm. um, because it may be that there are certain places where shipping a box of cameras is just like it's like that's stupid. Like I'm never getting anything out of that, right. um, and so at that point, it's like okay, well, what what how can I gather data in those situations, and and how can I gather data that's useful. Yeah. Um, in a much more maybe passive way, uh, yeah. in a much more less obtrusive way. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it too. And I appreciate it. I'm, I appreciate yeah. being part of this and, and having this conversation. All right. Sounds good. All right. Well, here with Michael Lorsing and uh, Transit and um, thanks so much. Thank you.